Thanks, everyone. Hello, and welcome to my portion of the stopwatch session, which is titled Open Access Viewpoints and Self-Archiving Decisions of Public Health Faculty. My name is Kayla Del Diondo, and I'm the Symbonis Librarian for Public Health at the Cushing Whitney Medical Library at Yale University. I'm hoping in the next five or so minutes, I'll take you through a timeline of a study which kicked off in September 2022. And the, for the remainder of the session and the majority of the session, I want to spend the most time talking about what we did this past summer, an exercise where we identified faculty growth areas in our nine key findings, and eventually how we sort of turned this into library outreach and instruction, which was centered on our faculty users' needs, which we turned over to the Yale School of Public Health leadership team, which I'll be referring to as YSPH. So to get started, these were the research questions that we started um, exploring. And we collected data through surveys with primary faculty at YSPH, along with uh, semi-structured interviews with eight primary faculty members. Our questions were, what are YSPH authors' understanding and viewpoints around open access, particularly green OA or self-archiving? Two, what are the barriers to self-archiving? What makes them want to do it, not want to do it? And finally, what is the information-seeking behavior of YSPH authors who are trying to find information about journals and see the journal's publishing policies and open access policies? So for the first question, um, like a high-level overview of what we gathered is that our faculty understand open access as free access for readers, and they really value open access, especially from like a public health perspective, because they want information to be available to all people very quickly. Although 20% of people um, in our study said that they don't fully understand what open access means and how they would publish open access. So there was still, while they supported, there was still a little bit of a disconnect with like theory versus practice. The barriers of self-archiving really ran the gamut in our findings. We found that most of our faculty do not self-archive, but some do, and the majority of those who are are doing it at the preprint level. So at the time they submit to a journal, they're also um, you know, uploading their work onto a preprint server. And the reasons for those who didn't self-archive are very varied. Um, we had someone kind of direct quote say they were lazy or busy or both, um, but then there were others who didn't quite understand what they were and were not allowed to do, whether they like opted and paid for gold open access or not. And finally, I found this part interesting. What is the information seeking behavior of faculty? We found that in terms of what journal they end up deciding on, um, journal reputation and journal impact factor is still sort of very pressing for all of them. That's at front of mind when they're making a decision about how to disseminate their scholarship. And most faculty visit the journal website, which I was pretty happy about because I think they should go sort of straight to the source and, and see what is and isn't allowed and how much it's going to cost and whatnot. So this is sort of the bulk of what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. I thought to myself, you know, what am I going to do with these findings? I learned about faculty preferences. I learned about faculty behaviors. What can the library do to support, you know, these faculty members and their publishing endeavors? So I wanted to really center our findings around the growth areas. I was referring to this at knowledge gaps in the beginning, and then I thought, you know, more of a growth mindset would be calling it growth areas. So I took our nine key findings, um, which are available on Open Science Framework. If you want to see the full exercise, I'll share that QR code at the end. But I wanted to turn each research finding into sort of the growth area and essential questions for learning it represented. So for instance, this is one of our nine findings, which is 20% of faculty don't fully understand what OA is and how they would achieve open access. So I thought here, the sort of underlying um, area for learning or growth area is open access publishing. And the essential questions underpinning that learning are what are the different kinds of OA and how and where can I publish open access? So we sort of decided, my collaborators and I, that the best um, way that the library could intervene and support faculty in this scenario is through an open access basics workshop with small departments of faculty over at the School of Public Health. We quickly realized, um, interestingly, that not every finding could be mapped to a growth area, while most of them could. Um, so for instance, we found that our faculty didn't want to have to go through the effort of putting their work in Eli Scholar, which is Yale's digital platform for scholarly publishing at the moment. So for this, um, finding the, the action item was sort of like some follow-up research. So I thought to myself, what semi-automated repository softwares may exist out there in the market if we know that our faculty don't want to go through that extra effort? So this led to us setting up a demo of Exploro with Ex Libris. But all in all, um, all of our findings matched the growth, growth areas, um, which resulted in interventions which we presented to YSPH stakeholders fell into three categories. Um, smaller workshops with departments of faculty, 
informational newsletters, you know, information we could be sending out to, to uh, faculty about the ways that we can support them. And finally, recommendations for YSPH leadership. So we were a little bit sort of bold. We wanted them to know um, what we were seeing in our study. And so for instance, um, one of the recommendations we made was that they incorporate an openness vision into the school's mission and core values so that faculty feel more supported going in this direction. Finally, uh, some lessons that we learned along the way. Like I said, this study sort of goes back to about a year ago, September 2022 is when we first launched the survey. Um, in the winter, we were conducting interviews. In you know, early 2023, we were analyzing the data. And then this summer was that you know, um, growth area exercise. These are our big takeaways. So we, we really benefited from engaging leaders early and often. Uh, admins at the School of Public Health helped us with like survey uptake. We quickly realized that we didn't want to assume that faculty know everything about anything. So even though they might have some publishing preferences, they wanted us as like information experts and people in tune with the scholarly publishing ecosystem to give them recommendations. So we were really excited to sort of learn that they wanted our input. Um, you can probably all take away that I, I really emphasize the focus on user needs when we were interpreting our findings. And finally, we're going to have to pick a place to start with our implementation. We can't do it all at once. So um, if you want to see our materials, I would highly recommend checking out all of our stuff on Open Science Framework. That's the QR code. Um, we have our survey questions and all nine findings. So thank you. Sarah Hobian and Paul St. Pierre will talk about OA strategy. They'll tell you the full uh, title of their presentation so I don't repeat myself. Please. Thank you. I'm Sarah Bobian. I am um, the AUL academic at the University of Guelph, which is in Ontario, which is in Canada. Um, and um, the topic we're talking about today is our Open um, Investment Strategy Committee. And so I serve as the co-sponsor of that committee. And with our structure, which Paul will talk a little bit about, um, there are two AULs. And between the two of us, all of the expertise in the committee reports up to both of our uh, both of our portfolios in different ways. So we co-sponsor the committee. So how did we get here? Um, we started out like many libraries uh, with different iterations of open access committees that would probably have benefited from a clearer scope and some structure. Our focus tended to be on advocacy or sometimes educational programming. Um, and that left us wondering what to do about and then how to fund the many OA initiatives that we encountered uh, constantly. So our approach was pretty ad hoc um, and we needed a strategy. We really needed a clear scope and ideally a dedicated budget so that we could actually implement things when they came our way. So as a result, a few years ago, we established our Open Investment Strategy Committee um, or OISC and then we got to work defining our OA future. Um, so here's the mandate for the committee. They focus on um, developing and driving an open investment strategy. They maintain and further develop evaluation criteria for, for the OA investments that we make. They do manage an OA collection budget. They also maintain a list of OA investments on our library website. Um, that's publicly available and we link to it in our final slide. Um, and then they work with consortial partners to advance OA priorities. And sometimes this might be at the provincial level in Ontario or ideally, maybe someday, um, the national level. But the other thing um, to share about the membership is that the committee is made up of members from our collections and content team. And then of course our research and scholarship team. And then there's a member at large from any other team in the library that rotates, uh, that position rotates. So one of the biggest um, factors, I think, in the success of this committee is that it is values-based and values-aligned. Um, and ideally, that we, we focus on transparency and all of these values when we make those decisions. Um, due to our limited time, we've given you the high-level values. But again, on our website, we have lots more detail um, about each of these. So the things that we look at when we're making decisions are indigenization, equity, diversity, and inclusion, privacy, accessibility um, and thinking about the public good for our university and beyond 
We, of course, also look at technical considerations or compatibility with existing infrastructure and so on. Uh, pricing and licensing, that's not the only criteria or the biggest one, but it is um, one of the criteria. And then also alignment with the goals of the university, the mission of the university, that sort of thing. Um, this also, all of these criteria serve as an accountability mechanism because using these we can explain um, how we arrived at each decision and why we arrived at each decision. And as I mentioned, we maintain a list uh, on our website, so it's always current, always up to date of the things we're investing in and the criteria that shaped those decisions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Paul, who will share a little bit more detail. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so my name is Paul St. Pierre. I'm the STEM Collections Librarian at the University of Guelph and the outgoing chair of the Open Investment Strategy Committee. Uh, so now, in the next three minutes, I'll speak about collaboration, workflows, and strategic thinking. So I'll whip through all sorts of things. So our library is uh, organized into functional teams, which really emphasizes skills, specialization, over breadth of knowledge. Um, and uh, that we see in a more traditional liaison librarian model. Uh, the meeting has ended, apparently. Uh, and I have lost here. Right, you're still up on there, but sorry about that. All right. Um, so as a member of the collections team, my main focus is to support readers by buying journals and books and so on. So spending the library's money is really my jam. Uh, my colleagues on the research and scholarship team, on the other hand, support authors by consulting with them about issues in publishing. OA advocacy, especially at the local level, is really their specialty. Uh, in our day-to-day -day activities, we rarely actually work together. And in fact, I collaborate more closely with collections librarians at other universities than I do locally. Um, so together, the committee comes together to support both authors and readers, so it really strengthens our ability to collaborate. And as a result, we're moving uh, to a more holistic approach that uh, allows us to shift our focus from purchasing OA collections to supporting open access infrastructure. Um, so, uh, since we're going very quickly here, uh, our investment criteria that Sarah talked about really gives us a framework, sort of a decision support system that's very simple, but it's systematic, so our decisions are consistent. It's transparent so that we can defend the decisions that we make and be more accountable. Why did you do Company of Biologists read and publish instead of the latest nature journal? So we're able to defend those sorts of decisions. And less interestingly and more bureaucratic is we work with our acquisitions manager to uh, create a checklist that allows uh, us to work more closely with vendors. A lot of OA vendors, the new OA vendors, are not very good at, at, at navigating university bureaucracies. So having something clear and systematic is very important. Um, so, and right now, uh, we're in a budget crunch, so we don't have new money to invest, but our committee is still able to work together to develop investment strategy, even though we don't have money to do strategic investment at the moment. So thank you very much. And <laughs> Angie, you're next. Angie will talk about artificial intelligence for the information profession. Thanks very much. Okay, and I'm going to time myself. Hello everyone, thanks very much for coming to the session. So I'm going to talk about AI in a different way since it's very fashionable right now for everyone to be talking about ChatGPT. I will show you a snippet that fits into our six minute container of a project where I use machine learning to normalize data. And is there a mouse here? 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll use the clicker. Oh, There's an arrow on it. Oh, uh, it's not moving. <laughs> That's yeah. not intuitive. All right, it's rubbed off, waiting for the next speaker. So artificial intelligence has actually been around since the 1950s, and it started in a formal way in 1950 when British mathematician of Bletchley Park fame in 1950 pondered whether computers can think in a logical fashion. And so this article he wrote is considered the seminal work that got the artificial intelligence movement going. And it started very slowly and my, okay. Okay, so there are lots of types of artificial intelligence, and it really started out as a productivity tool because all of us who work with data know that it's really hard to gain insights when getting insights requires cleaning up the data so that you have something analyzable and consistent so that you can draw insights and then their machine learning and so for example you might have seen something like you're browsing something and you'll get a feed that says you may also like that's a recommender system then there are also classification systems that will help with curating collections and there are expert systems that are more narrowly focused on a knowledge domain with deep analysis to help with decision support. Then the more modern iterations of natural language processing are feeders of language translation, generative AI, both in um, text and image and AV text analysis. But because we only have six minutes and the slides are linked from the presentation um, description, so they're there for you if you're interested in seeing it in more depth. So there's just a lot. And I will go into a machine learning example that I can actually show in six minutes. So. I was aiming at a classifier tool, and the context is our library has been wanting to develop a, um, a web-based new titles <coughs> list for a long time, but the care and feeding was too work intense. But in those years since I got to our library, the analytics piece of our library system has gotten more and more built out over time to make it possible to draw from multiple types of records to pull in that information that was needed by fund code as an approximate proxy for subject and bibliographic data for subject descriptions. But as we all know, a lot of records can be skimpy with pieces of information missing, so there's not a straight up subject label to pull from to just conveniently generate the list. And so the machine learning I used in order to let the algorithm infer from data that are there. So I set up a training data set. And then based on those patterns in the training data set that consists of if the record has these words describing, then I want this output to give me the control vocabulary subject that was then going to feed into the ultimate project. And so, long story short, the goal was to give me a clean data set to pull from. And then this is an example of the productivity gap. Fund codes were generic and subject agnostic. Then here are blank subject names. And so those are productivity gaps. So I use prompt loop and it works with Excel and it also works with Google Sheet and you can load it as a plugin. And so I prepared the data by concatenating the title fields with metadata fields <laughs> to give a rich body of 
data for the machine to analyze and extrapolate the subject I want. And so here's the syntax for concatenation. And the right column is the control vocabulary example of the output fields I wanted. And those are records from my data set that actually have information. So these are some examples. And then for the next set, I have the blank fields. And here's the syntax, yes ma'am. And so I ran this and in the first and then I copied the formula to the next cells and then it gave me mostly accurate associations but some where there weren't enough they were few enough to fill in manually and that gave me a head start in producing this end product and thank you very much the product takeaways are, you know, the data are never clean, you'll run into snags. With free versions, you'll run into data size limits. And more takeaways are on the slides. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Um, by now, we've published 35 books, uh, um, and most of them shift um, uh, to open access four years after their initial publication. Uh, Signali now consists of three tracks. In 2018, we started a program for new uh, English language translations of key German language works in theory, philosophy, and social and cultural criticism. This fall, we announced a new program for short books, extended essays on breaking topics. Uh, and these new tracks uh, join the, the original Signala program for new English language monographs. I would say that um, the division of labor among, um, among the library staff and the press staff and the strong um, uh, uh, scholarly uh, editorial board is probably really the most exciting and instructive aspect of, the, of what we might call the Signala model. Uh, our work brings together the labor of um, humanity, brings the labor of humanities publishing to the center of campus and lends visibility to the stakes of publishing uh, um, in the university community. Our attention to sustainability has helped both the library and the press to better understand and control publishing costs. Jane, please continue. Thank you, Kaiser. A unique business model was developed wherein percentages of net sales revenue is a portion to cover a variety of direct and indirect costs. What's left over is held in an account to defray the costs of future book projects in the series. Another important component to sustainability is templated designs. And in the first decade of the series, a freelancer was used to do production editing and copy editing. The project management handled by this person and by Kaiser largely cut the projects out of the press's EDP department. When that editor retired, we folded the production aspects into the press's workflows. Open access was built in from the start, with books going away after four years. The Signali books were the, the first front list Cornell Press books to be made routinely open. This also has evolved. At first, we just made the ebooks available for free on the Signali website because there was no OA infra infrastructure, but now they join a growing cohort of OA books, over 200 from the press that are available across multiple OA ebook platforms Cornell Open, JSTOR Open, Project Muse Open, and OAPEN. Next slide. Signali was formative for the press's ebooks program. At the time the series was conceived, the press was not routinely producing front list ebooks. This future oriented series operated as the change agent, nudging press workflows to evolve as we sought greater efficiencies to serve the developing multimodal landscape. And the print book component also helped lead the press toward greater use of print on demand or POD, now the print method of choice for the majority of front list monographs. Next slide. As for scalability, spoiler alert, it has not been scalable for us. <laughs> there was outreach to other campus departments to partner on similar series, but only one other was established. Though it differs significantly in its particulars and has not been able to sustain a similar volume and without a dedicated staffer to attend to that and other matters, sustainability is challenging. Importantly and finally, were the model scaled up to a significant portion of any publisher's list, the economics may sour quickly. And a reminder that original Signali Fund was aided by a sizable investment from Mellon and the library, which continues to invest by supporting Kaiser's work on the series and maintaining the dedicated website, as well as the College of Arts and Sciences. But with good partners, a clear vision, and limited scope, we are confident a similar model for other threatened areas in the humanities is entirely possible, and the collaboration has helped, has helped build relationships with the library and with Cornell faculty and strengthened the press in very valuable ways. Thank you very much for your attention. And last but not least, Catherine Hallman will talk about Sushify, and she'll tell you more. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, I am Katherine Heilman and I work as the Electronic Resources Librarian at UNC Greensboro University Libraries. Today I'm going to share my experiences implementing Sushi Protocol. So before we dive into the details, let's start with what Sushi means in a library context. Sushi, or Standardized Usage Statistics Harvesting Initiative, is a protocol used in libraries in the library and information industry, its purpose is to automate the retrieval of usage statistics for electronic resources like e-journals and e-books and databases. 
Uh, this automation streamlines data exchange between content providers like publishers and database vendors and libraries, making it efficient um, to collect, manage, and analyze your use of statistics. So let's talk about why I went on this venture. So in recent decades, libraries have seen a tremendous increase in resource acquisitions. For instance, at our library, 90% uh, of our collections budget is allocated towards e-resources. However, uh, managing this content started and continues today to be primarily manual. It takes us weeks every year to collect counter usage, re counter usage reports from our various providers and now getting started on expired passwords and inherited disorganized shared drives and the like. But my passion as a librarian is process improvement. And it was clear to me that we could do better when I started this position three years ago. Our library just simply lacked the infrastructure to manage its um, collection effectively. So what do you need? Uh, oh, sorry. At my library, we spend uh, about three to four weeks every year collecting usage stats. And my job is not only to count like how many e-resources we actually have, but the usage for each one of those. And we subscribe to thousands and thousands and thousands of resources. So of course, we have a methodology we've been using, and it works, but it's a real slog. So I wanted to automate the process as much as possible, you know, for reasons like efficiency and time saving. Um, data accuracy, improved management, and all of those good things. So, what do you need to configure Sushi? In my case, I needed a platform to help me channel the data. Um, I'm great at some aspects of librarianship, but working with coding and APIs is not where I shine. So, I did some market research and uh, proposed and ultimately received funding to uh, purchase SpringShare's Live Insight program. I want to make a quick note that this is not a specific endorsement for SpringShare's product. There's a lot of usage consolidation services that would have met our needs just as well. Uh, so to configure Sushi, you always need a service endpoint URL. That's the credentials that you need to start with. This is simply the URL you use to connect on the internet to the vendor. Um, but then you need some combination of the latter three bullet points. You'll see this is an example when I log in, this is fake numbers, but when you log into Taylor and Francis and I needed to find our sushi, sushi credentials for them, it looks similar to this and you just input the data and you know test it and connect it. So this is an example of the dashboard. Um, I probably spend the equivalent time configuring Sushi for all our content providers as I do every year just doing our gen general usage statistics gathering project. But the beauty here is, is that this high upfront level of effort is going to pay off for five years. Each content provider that I have input is set to retrieve monthly reports until 2028. That was the furthest out in the future it allowed me to go, so I went with it. But it also allowed me to retrieve three years of back data. Um, this is an example of the dashboard for some of our journals. It can also show um, databases and ebooks. Um, on this page, you'll see high level information that shows packages, number of journals in each package, as well as overall total item requests for the input time I put in here. It was our fiscal year 23. Um, and moving forward, it can also show. Um, pretty pie charts if you need to communicate with stakeholders, or maybe you just want to visualize the information in a different way that works better for you. This next one is my favorite way the dashboard works. Um, it's a more granular view. This is our Taylor and Francis journal package. So you'll see that it still has the high level um, information of number of titles and total item investigations. Um, but it also shows each individual journal title within that package, as well as its corresponding um, use, um, total item investigations for each title. And it's consistent. This is what I like about this. I can log into Live Insight for all of our journal packages and download a CSV report. Uh, which if you've ever done this yourself on any given admin page, the user friendliness and the ability to actually find information varies greatly. Reflections. So on the plus side, uh, this automates data retrieval. It improves efficiency and accuracy and gives near instant access to what I consider as our vital statistics. However, 
Uh, it comes with, you know, a high level of setup time. Um, there's also reliance on vendors for cooperation when it comes to configuring. Every once in a while it doesn't configure, you gotta figure out why and you gotta work with the vendor to do that. Um, and this also isn't free for us. We invested in this um, product to help us. So I guess the main takeaway that I'm looking for you to get from my experience here is that um, I spent a lot of years being intimidated by sushi harvesting, I thought. I didn't have the technical skill set or the budget or even the influence to the influence to make the case that collection infrastructure is equally important to how many e-resources you can acquire. So reflecting back, I got through it, I did it, and it was a success in my opinion. And if I can do it, you can do it too.